how do you make comics without all the frustration, without feeling lousy and inadequate all the time? Join me, Jess Rolipson, and me, Tom Hart, on The Terrible Anvil. Each week, we build community and shift our mindset about what it means to make comics and art. We're working through the whole process, one piece at a time, turning our suffering and angst into fun and glee. Join us at sawcomics.org. Hi, this is Jess Rulipson coming at you somewhat live or recorded. It's live right now. Um, uh, we're at the Virtual Sequential Artist Workshop, and I've just told Tom that planning is overrated because <laughs> I do have a plan, but I've forgotten it. But I do know, I can tell you. Oh, by the way, uh, my dazzling co-host. Tom Hart. Tom Hart is here with yeah. me. Yeah. The aforementioned Tom is he's going to help, be helping me thread the needle on this idea of starting over. This is the episode, the 14th episode of The Terrible Anvil, and we're concerned about how and when and, and types of starting over. I love a category. I think this is a great topic. I think this, I could just keep saying that. I think this is a great topic. I think there's so, so much to feeling like you have to have a great beginning, not and getting really lost in a project and not realizing like it's not working for you and not realizing why you're unhappy. And then you just keep pushing it and pushing it. And, but then, and that for me, that's me, <laughs> but there are lots of other, there are lots of other variations on starting over and, uh, you know, rebooting as well, or, or doing a project for, or, or hitting some themes for a second time, even, oh, wait, we're supposed to spotlight each other. I'm going to do that while you comment on what I just sort of said. I'm here. glad Tom's spotlighting us because my hair looks amazing. So if you're watching uh, the YouTube version of this, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I just blow dried it and it hasn't started raining yet. So I'm like really thrilled. We look amazing. But if you're just listening to the audio, you'll have to take my word for it that uh, we don't have faces for radio. We really should be on screen at all times. We're very good looking cartoonists. Um, Yes, yeah, starting over. <laughs> I feel like I start over every time we do this podcast. <laughs> so I was also thinking about the different types of starting over, some of the obvious stuff, like uh, putting a project away out of frustration or busyness and the, or sadness, other nesses, and then um, revisiting some, some old work or finding finished work in an old drawer. Um, one of our delightful students, Janice, has been showing us stuff, uh, freelance stuff she's been doing or had done years ago and it's all fabulous and she's like oh I could learn from this let me do this again I forgot <laughs> how awesome this was um so so that's kind of a starting over too but I was also thinking about my obsession with painting very small portraits over and over and then eventually moving on to painting portraits of Prince the recording artist and gouache over and over a little four by five pieces of paper and in, in some way knowing I was going to make another immediately after that if I had the energy which most likely if I hadn't done like 20 of them in a sitting, I was like, oh, I'm going to do another one. So just knowing that there was another one, like a fresh box of cookies. <laughs> I know I don't have to go to the grocery store right away. So I was like, ah, this is awesome. I get to do another one. So the pressure of making it perfect was okay. So there is an element to starting over and working in a series too. And I do think in some ways, most comics, comics that are longer than one page, but even multi-panel comics, so maybe this only excludes gag panel cartoons. Uh, you have another chance in, in the following panel or the following page to completely reinvent, maybe not start over with your medium completely, but like um, reinvent the way you're working or the way you're approaching it or how it might feel. So if the first page starts to feel crappy, you're like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll try again on page two. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's always true, but I, I find that a lot of people even writers who are just working specifically with prose and not pictures, the very first section of anything they make sounds and feels a little different from the rest of it once the groove has sort of set into the vinyl. So um, it's not exactly an explicit starting over, but there can be uh, different qualities throughout the work. And I don't think progress is linear or chronological. <laughs> like, uh, it, I mean, everything else seems to proceed step by step a lot of things do but um but yeah I, I think um 
I don't know that that cliche. It's it's not the destination; it's the journey. Tom, <laughs> all that stuff is true. All those cliches are true. That's why they're delightful. And then you see them printed on a piece of wood at Hobby Lobby, and you're like, okay, <laughs> "I've done it again." It is live, the destination. Laugh, love. Am I right, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> live, laugh, love. Start again. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> I, I love that idea that you can reinvent. You know your. your every panel you can reinvent and that's sort of like there's this you know this buddhist idea or it's any any kind of spiritual idea that like you know pretty much all that matters is this moment and at this moment you have all these choices you can make and how you present yourself and how you think and what you um what you allow into your consciousness and and what and you know we could recreate the world every moment but we don't we sort of just get into a groove <laughs> you said the we Yes. Sometimes we prefer a groove because the right. cho choice paralysis is real. And we're like, oh, dear God, I have right. to make a decision <laughs> in order to fix I wake it. up in the morning and like, thank God I'm on earth, even though I hate earth, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's solid. It's a solid pick. Right. It's the place I know. It's like, oh my God, but what a mess, you know, but it's the mess we've got. Right. So maybe, I don't know, maybe that's something we should, we should, figure out which starting over we want to talk about and hit them in, in, in a series. Like, you know, there's this, there's the starting over when you want to throw away a project that, that you've put some heart into and you just realize it's not going anywhere. There's, um, I like that you said working in a series is a way of starting over. And that, that is really wonderful to know that you've got another chance and that chance is coming soon. And my, my experience with daily comics was the same way. Um, it could be a way to develop your style, the topic of our previous episode. Um, so what are the types of starting? I, well, up? I don't know. There's those two. <laughs> Dasher, I'll... Dancer, Prancer, Vixen. Uh, there, I... Well, there's the, the really serious, scary one that I feel like is completely rethinking a project you've sunk a lot of enthusiasm and hours into, right. which seems like a lot of people have a like, oh, no, I have to redo this. Right different way have you ever done that I don't know if I've done anything super well you have um I know for a while your your book of interviews was also partial memoir right and then yeah. and then you abandoned that or in what way did you did you change that that idea that was nice and then I knew that going into the project I was like I want this to be a graphic novel but I don't really have interest or an idea in terms of like having the same exact set of question for every person I interviewed. I was just like, the structure for this is going to emerge later. I just know I want to talk to a lot of different people. I'll figure out the number of people. Loosely, I knew I wanted to pick like someone from every branch of the military. Again, very deeply sorry, Coast Guard. I did not put you in the graphic novel. Um, but kind of having some loose parameters and just believing it, this is going to be a graphic novel eventually and it'll work itself out. Um, but but yeah, I think early on, I, I think a lot of people who work in nonfiction are like, well, I should provide context for the story because I'm the one telling it and it's not mine explicitly. So I need to let you know I'm the other person in the room that it's being filtered, mm -hmm. through, you know, my edits and, and the visual choices I'm making. Uh, we have another great student, Galena, who's uh, working with some uh, text from a, a diary that was her grandmother's and um I think that she just like slipped in in the subtitle this is from my from my grandmother's diary or something like that it was like a beautiful solution just to like give the reader a heads up so I think in my head it was a natural place to start like oh I should be in there so you mm -hmm. know what who's talking I guess um so the, one of the earlier comics I did said oh I was uh with some other artists and we went to the military hospital and we were drawing portraits of veterans and then I met this guy who was a veteran that was convalescing there. And then I talked to him and then his story starts. And uh, the piece I just finished for, uh, now I can say it's the Washington Post. I've been complaining about <laughs> drawing roosters, but it's live um, and it came out great. Um, there are two voices in that comic as well. There's the narrative sort of journalistic voice and then the first person voice of the person that was interviewed for that comic. And our solution to that was the journalistic voice, the caption boxes, were rectangles and then the person the first person point of view narrative they were more like squigglier <laughs> rectangles like torn paper almost uh but it's very subtle and so that you can work with multiple voices but anyway 
I, at some point, I kept writing down ideas for my memoir that became less and less related to the things the veterans were telling me. And I was like, oh, like leaping out of the shower to write down these ideas because I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And it's all going to go in this one book. And I just realized, oh, all these eggs don't have to go in this basket. This might be another book. Just because the other things that were coming up were sort of diluting the energy of the the narratives from the veterans. And that, that was really the only reason. And it wasn't too far down the rabbit hole. Um, and sometimes a gear shift like that can feel really good, but it didn't feel like starting over. It felt more like changing lanes or something, but still going in the same direction. Uh -huh. In a lot of ways, dropping weight. I was like, oh, good. I don't have to talk about myself. I was trying to avoid that to begin with. Oh, that's great, though. That's great. I mean, you know, we, we talk a lot about how we, ideally, in most circumstances, it'd be nicer to make things easier on us as artists and not harder. Yeah. So Ooh, if, if you can make it easier, do that. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, if there is a choice where you can lighten your load a little bit, that's usually the one to make. And we've been talking in in, in the network also about, like, are there ways to really face things, um, the real serious heavy things? And, you know, and sometimes it does take a little a little effort and a little force and, and a little stamina. But other times, at least on this podcast, we're like, take the easy way out. But anyway, let's talk about starting over. Yeah, there's like two massive convictions. It's like, I have to do this. And then like, oh, I don't have to do that. Like, <laughs> I feel like the I don't have to do that is something that came with age. I was like, oh, I can say no to everything. <laughs> and so now I have to pull it back. I'm like, all right, all right, maybe I can say you know, less the time. Car Carlo here at Saw, hopefully this isn't too inside baseball for everybody on the podcast, but Carlo here at Saw just turned 30, like a couple of days ago. And I yeah. told him, and with great great wisdom and authority, I thought, I said, you know, 30 was the year that I looked back and I said, I don't have to take shit from anybody anymore. And he said, everybody's been telling me that. I was like, oh, really? I thought that was just me. <laughs> it's like Tomism yeah. for a gift from my brain to yours. Yeah. And Carla's well, like, yeah, that 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 about 30. Anyway, oh, let's talk about starting over. So I, let's the, start over, Tom. <laughs> and that's, that works too. The good the good anecdote I have is that, um, you know, I made this memoir and it was a really heavy grief memoir and it was a really acute thing. You know, I had, you know, I, it was very much about something very uh, quick that happened and that was shocking and, um, and that I had to do. And then, um, and then uh, my agent says after the book came out and stuff like that, um, She's like, um, yeah, the um, publishers really want to know, you know, if you want to do another memoir. And, you know, at first I'm like, do I do I have to go through something like that again? To, to, to like, Yeah, you're like, oh. I don't have any other like, right. yeah, like traumas this. or, yeah. <laughs> and, was the thing. But, but I realized also, though, that it was a really great feeling and practice to be so connected artistically with so many internal things and and I did have um a second child at that point Molly Rose who's who anyway something like that and so and I realized like you know this isn't Molly Rose's emergence onto this plane and into our family is this kind of heavy thing and kind of really interesting and and I started to document it and started to sort of plan you know maybe maybe because I was still in that rhythm of telling a kind of type a type of memoir so I still had access to like how that works and um and so I started writing ideas and I started planning and I started um weaving in all sorts of things and um and it got to the point where the outline the outline for the was 25 typed pages and I was like, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> like, isn't that would have to be like a 600 page graphic? Yeah, yeah, it was like a 400 page book about like, just being a, a dude, you know, <laughs> like, like just being an ordinary person who has feelings and, and a child and stuff like that. And I was like, no. And then, and so I, I had to, and I had this like outline, it was like, it was on multiple walls of my studio and it was just like all there and I was like scribbling on it and I was really excited to be inside of it literally inside of it and um but then I just realized that 
was some, that I don't I don't that project was was not going to happen in the way that I envisioned. And then luckily, what happened? Complete coincidence. Vanessa Davis emailed me out of the blue, and there was some sort of new website in LA starting. And weirdly, this website acted like they started websites. They were like, we've got this great idea for, it's going to have content and <laughs> articles. And I'm like, okay, this is like 2018, I think. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and she said, do you have any ideas for a comic strip? And I looked on my 25 page outline and I pointed and read on page 24, kind of right really towards the end. I was like, that would make a great comic strip. And it was this fiction that was kind of a dream sequence. It was going to be this dream sequence in the, the larger second memoir that never happened about this guy dying on his back. And I said, yeah, Vanessa, I've got a great idea for a comic strip. And I just took that one line from the outline and turned that into what was a really fun project for like three or four years. Um, never expected it, but it was the right thing to do. And then, uh, and so I've talked a lot on this podcast about how, like, I did that for about five, what's five times 24, 125 pages or so. And then I hit another wall where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And the same thing kind of happened where I had bigger, more ideas and like so many ideas that I was starting to fill up books with them and stuff. And, they, and in a similar but different kind of way, I looked at it and I was like, I don't want to do this that's when I started making music. <laughs> and then I, so fun. I, yeah, I like the idea of like uh, carefully collecting this basket of gorgeous flowers and then being like, I don't, I, or maybe <laughs> pressing them and preserving them somewhere, but being like, oh, you know, what? I think this is as far as this is going to go. Like it was, well, uh, right. and you never know. I mean, it ain't over until it's over. Like we never know how these things will reemerge in other. But you have pieces. to steward things a little bit. So like after the, you know, I, Towards the end of the mute, towards the end of the year that I was doing music, I said, you know, this year anniversary is coming up soon. And I've gotten so much out of it, but I'm kind of miss cartooning, I think. So I was like, okay, when the when the year deadline hits, don't look at the piano anymore. Stay away from the whole music thing and just see if you could like start drawing again and see. Because the, what I knew very, very consciously going in was that I was starting. I was trying to get into a beginner's mind, just sort of starting over with like, what kind of stories do I want to tell? Which kind of rhythms do I want to be in? What kind of creator do I want to be? And story and songwriting gave me way more of that than cartooning. So I could sort of re-examine mm -hmm. who I was as a as an artist. And then um, so now I'm starting to be like, let's make comics. How can I do that in the ways that I that I've learned from songwriting and in the ways that I've learned from doing daily comics? But then I just like literally just this morning, because we were thinking about this podcast, I remembered this 25 page outline. I was like, it's gotta be something in there I could use. <laughs> so that's so like, true. That's true. Yeah, going back to what 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 do we have in the fridge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for exactly. dinner. That is right. good. Yeah. I had a really weird lunch. I had like a, a hard boiled egg and some beets and uh some artichoke, just random stuff in my fridge. I looked at this bowl and I was like, I don't know, <laughs> just ate it. It was delicious. I don't know if it was a common, but it was a good snack. Yeah, and it'd be great to be like, I'm just gonna see, I'm just gonna show up at Jess's house and see what and see what she feeds me from her fridge. Cause like that's kind of a glorious experience. Yeah, yeah, we gotta eat. And then yeah, that's like an answer uh, to a, a call to arms, I guess. And hunger is always so fine. So I I mean I don't I don't know if I'm like if I'm advocating anything, I'm just saying like start the the need to like walk away from something and start over has happened many times to me. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's been good when I, when I can recognize that, like, but actually a lot of times the critical thinking happens way too early and, and like you start something and almost immediately you're like, nah, don't do that one. And then almost, you know, so if you're like starting with a blank page, your inner critic can be, can be, getting you to start over every moment because it doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything. That's yeah, true. that's true. It's like, oh, this is this is going to be a real thing or a comic with a capital C. So it's got to be like somewhat good or sustainable or tenable or something like that. So your critic is out, but you're also like, I oh, don't know, no, I did that last time. <laughs> also very similar to dinner. Oh, we had pasta last night. We don't want to have <laughs> ravioli two nights in a row. Um, I mean, I would happily <laughs> sometimes doing the same thing over and over. People, people famously eat the same thing for breakfast or lunch regularly. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so that can be a scary type of starting over. Um, 
And I, I, I don't know if it was similar at all, but after I finished the graphic novel and turned it in, I really was searching for something else to, to work on. And I had gotten in such a, I wouldn't say it was like an easy groove, but I had, it, I had become habituated to working on this bigger project and it was finally done. And I sort of wonder if that's why I took my time on it. Cause I was like, what am I going to do next? I, I wasn't thinking of that consciously, but once it was off my desk, um, it was quite a relief and it was something I was proud of. And I didn't immediately think like, oh, I have to work on something. I was like, I need a break. I could definitely feel that. But, um, but then, I mean, it, it was just this, um, like quietness where there was, uh, you know, a little bit of noise or something. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do next, I guess. And I, and I found other disciplines to work in like prose. Um, so kind of similar though. I, I, I didn't quite get a footing there where I was like, oh, okay, I can, I can kind of hide out in this. Um, and then I got really, um, comfortable like not making anything <laughs> like I, I i and i really enjoyed like just doodling i was like ah, i want to do something that doesn't matter because everything seemed to have mattered for a long time and I, I just didn't want things to matter i don't know how to say that without it sounding weird but um and, and now I, I seem to be doing stuff that's motivated by external factors like deadlines and compensation <laughs> i guess like if someone's like hey do you want to do this and and i i'm lucky that i live with my collaborator on some of these projects so if if he's gone through the trouble of writing something and his writing is pretty good that's sort of catnip for me i'm like oh that would make a cool comic um and that's sort of that's like a funny sticker that we we published at saw a year or two about this past year or so this would make a great comic and i think um was it Carlo that drew it? The UFO? <laughs> it's like someone Emma, getting Emma. a picture. Oh, it's such a cute drawing. It's very, very funny. It's just like someone in the throes of like a crazy experience. I mean, this would be a great comic. Um, so yeah, I feel like we're, as cartoonists, we're always kind of keeping an eye out for what the next thing is. And then there's certainly people who are in a rhythm and, and have devoted themselves to a longer form project that absolutely love knitting a scarf for a friend or working on a short diary comics or like kind of ha having smaller pots uh simmering as a way to sustain the bigger thing um and then there's artists we know like sam alden who completely changes um not exactly a style but a little bit but but changing his medium between every project like watercolor and then like kind of pixel art and then just black and white just pencil all ink so everything's kind of different um I want to go back to what you were talking about, about working in a series. But before that, I just want to say to everyone who's here watching live, if you have questions, put them in the chat. And also, Jess, you, there were a couple questions in the pre-cap, right? So maybe we could get to those in a bit. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, but this of working in a series is such a delightful, um, delightful way to allow yourself to um, start over. And again, you know, a lot of times for, for me, it seems to like, come down to how do I trick the, the inner critic into letting me be creative and not being such a jerk, you know? <laughs> and if I can, if I can work small, if I can work in, um, in little pieces, if I can work in a series, it doesn't think that the, uh, the grand thing I'm working on, it doesn't worry too much about that. And, um, and even, even still, like, like I say, I keep, I, I'm really close to, I'm kind of doodling a lot and thinking about this next, the next things I want to do. And I was thinking like, maybe I should just do six page comics. And then, I, and then, but I could tell my, my critic was like, they got to be perfect. I was like, okay, how about four panels? And my inner critic wasn't too chatty about that. I was like, okay, I think it'll let me get away with four panels. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do some four panel things and see how that goes. And if I'm lucky, maybe they start to add up to something. I don't know. But if not, I, I know from experience that doing four panels and then another four panels and then another four panels is wonderful. It's really wonderful. I had, I had the best time of my creative life when I was working on daily strips, as crazy as that sounds. The only thing I miss. Like also, like having an idea is like something we're pressing on. Like, is this an idea? Is this an idea? <laughs> so like some, sometimes I think early on in the podcast series we talked about ideas like having an idea and how sacred it is and how you can't tell too many people and you have to kind of be sneaky around it as if it's this like sort of thing you're hunting down um but I, yeah but I, it's 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 almost like dating early on or getting to know a friend or something and just someone you, you recently met and you're trying to get to understand them 
and you're like, are you a friend? <laughs> or like, are you my uh, <laughs> future BFF for decades? Like, no one ever really knows that. I mean, there's always like apocryphal stories that are like, I, I knew from that moment on that we would be best <laughs> friends. But uh, most of the friends I've had for the longest are like, how the hell did we meet? I can't remember. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's it's hard to know exactly where certain things will lead. Um, but if you have these like, goals or desires in your heart already you're kind of keeping an eye out for it sort of like having <laughs> this is a really dumb analogy but i love the crispy m&ms the cookie m&m and it would be a food analogy or right, sorry go ahead. I, I, i'm on a food kick i guess that weird lunch is not tidying me over but uh these the share size allegedly share size but really it's it's just a ziploc bag i, I don't think i would share it with anyone because there's not enough candy in well, there, i think but you'd I, share the singer no, a share <laughs> size, though we love her. We love share. Um, that's share size, but not like uh, the size of M&Ms that you would get at the checkout, but like something yeah. a little more substantial for snacking over a period of days, ideally. So I like getting a little bit of M&Ms here and there to treat myself when I'm working. So these are M&Ms I cherish. I love this flavor. It reminds me of a discontinued M&M &M flavor. That, and so it's like, this is the best I can get. And it's a treat and it's affordable. Well, they used to be $3.99 a bag. And now the price is like, I'm not exaggerating, like $5.99 and $6.99 a bag. And I won't pay that much for M&Ms. And I also think there's more air in the bag. So anyway, if you've, if you've been sort of enamored with a product that's, you know, disposable like that, maybe you have something similar to that. Like they reformulated my favorite face cream or I don't know I don't know what your deal is but let's just say your deal is my deal um but if I see those M&Ms on sale for $3.99 they go in the cart I'm like yes so like keeping an eye out for an opportunity for the thing that you like and would like to enjoy doing is good but you have your boundaries you're like oh I can't do a 400 page thing or we're a 25 page outline that's too much but this is this has become kind of this outline has become a sacred document you go back to you're like there's got to be something else in there I, I had that vanessa davis b is dying thing so there's probably something else in here if i want to start making comics again so sometimes starting over isn't starting at the very 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 beginning there is some type of bat file <laughs> a random yeah. file of stuff you're like what about this or oh my gosh i forgot i made that why why did i ever stop painting or oh i forgot i'd like to do that um actually i uh, think I'm a pretty bad example when it comes to that. And I I forget too often, like I've got, there's some sort of demented part of my, um, of my belief system that thinks that starting over means starting from scratch and being blindingly original and brilliant from, from the beginning and forgetting that I've mind that I've got, I mean, I've got cases of notebooks and sketchbook. I've got like boxes and boxes of sketches and notebooks that I never, ever, ever, ever look at. Why? I look at Austin Kleon, you know, me, like a lot of people, I read his weekly emails and stuff. And he's like, yeah, today's the annual day where I look over my my previous month's notebooks. I'm like, he does that? I'm like, yeah. oh, why don't why I do that? that? You know? I, yeah, I the only time I ever have a reckoning is when I'm clearing my desk and I find like a to-do list from four months ago and I'm like, I did all of those things, sort of, <laughs> like I get to throw it away, but I don't, yeah, I don't hold on to them. That is such a good practice. Are you trying to do more of that now, Tom? Like, Yeah, well, that's what I said when I, I said, why don't I look at that old outline and why don't I look at these things that, that I've put into, uh, you know, put into a band, is that the right word? Sort of just put into a into some baggage or some luggage yeah. um and because well you know there's this idea like for a lot of people um working on a memoir for instance you can't really work on a memoir until you've got some distance from the, the things you're trying to tell that's true from a lot of people if not most people so it's just like you lack this you lack this perspective and i'm starting to think that for me and I'm not like a great creative mind or anything. I actually think I worked really hard at pretty much everything and not well. <laughs> but but I do think like when I come up with ideas, I think I'm actually better off when I throw them away for a while and come back to them in the same way that a memoirist might work on material that's happened a, a while back. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to think that like maybe going back into my notebooks is 
Because when I do look at things, especially like sometimes I do those Friday night comics just about every week and I never look back at them. Occasionally I do. I'm like, oh, how charming. Like, you know, it's badly drawn, of course, because I'm ch chatting and typing and drawing and not thinking well. But but I think, wow, what a fun little thing that I could like develop. And like, and I'm like, other artists do this. Other artists work from their sketches or they have, you know, Prince had 800 hours of tape that he would sometimes, you know, pull something from now and then, I'm sure, right? Yeah. Or I mean, famously, like, discard or record over. He he would do, like, perfect it, tape, and everyone in the session would be like, this, oh, my God, you have to, this is going to be a number one hit, and he would just delete it. Record over it? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I, there's, there's lessons to learn from all of these ideas, but, the, I mean, definitely, like, giving permission to go back to stop to look to start again this is where we're getting to it's just you're building the archive that's the phrase i had when you were describing um this idea of like not thinking too hard about making ideas um committing them to the paper and then letting them wander off into a folder somewhere um well again yeah. go ahead. oh i was just gonna you know people are getting tired of me talking about music but <laughs> But like, I got to the point over a year where I was like, okay, how do I write a song? And and I knew that how how I, I got to the point where how I wrote a song was like, I noodled around for quite a while, knowing full well that most of what was coming out was garbage, but knowing full well that a little bits would be good. And I would, and then, then I would go back and listen, look for those good bits, and then sort of like collage together. And I love the collaging part. And like, why can't I do that in comics? Instead, I I think everything's got to be perfect. So I'm a good cartoonist. <laughs> or have like a clear draft of each phase, which can be useful if you're collaborating with people that like right. the only way to work. Yeah, like it sounds like uh, rummaging and um, repurposing and um, scavenging and then collaging. Scavenging. Together. Now you're talking my language. I'm writing that one down. Frolicking and scavenging with Tom Hart. Scavenging. <laughs> Anita's got some questions, and I know uh, you had some questions in the pre-cap, but you also, I cut you off at least two or three times. So what I was we... just going to, yeah, direct us to the chat because Anita had something to say, and maybe I'm I'm stuck on Anita's, because it's hard for me to navigate the chat sometimes, and, and then I just see this red box that says 18 new messages, and I'm like, one at a time. <laughs> but it's probably just Meg being amazing and uh, notating our shenanigans. Well, I can I can direct you to, um, to Anita's. The, fir the first, yeah. So the first question I'm noticing is, what about starting over in the middle of what you're doing for a deadline, but still being true to the pitch? Like, describe that method of starting over. Was was the book that you delivered um, very different from your book pitch, for example? Like, was there an element of starting over in that? I know you said there was like a tone to it that was like a bit more fierce, and then it sort of changed a little bit. Yeah, I mean, for that, I I think it's true that in book publishing, I can't speak to something that's maybe nonfiction and for the purpose of educating, but I think in general, I think book publishing editors are pretty familiar with the idea of getting a book that's not exactly the book they signed up for, but that's that they're pretty comfortable with. Like, oh, like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, so you took it in a different direction. You know, it's not, I think that's pretty common. So I don't know, and Onita, you can tell us more in the in the chat what your pitch was and how how you're feeling, uh, why you're feeling like disconnected from it. But 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 my understanding is that in publishing, it's pretty common for to say like, well, it was supposed to be all about this like uh, you know this incident I had with the pineapple, but I really got invested in in the sort of cart in the car chase. So <laughs> like, oh okay. There, there are other things that are like it's just called project development and other like if, some, if there's usually a team of people working on. Uh, designing a car or um i don't know other types of things like housing subdivisions or whatever there's usually a group of people but if you're all the people in one you know you, you can have a group meeting or whatever i don't know how um multi-personality disorder you are but uh you have to wear a, a couple of different hats so sometimes you're like oh that's a cool idea and you, you start and you go in that direction and then uh you might shift gears might drop it start it up again you might change mediums uh, one of the things that I think is enjoyable about watching like competitive baking shows or Project Runway or something yeah. like that 
these are our parameters, there's a deadline, it almost seems as if it can't be done. And then other things happen, you're like, oh, this is the fabric I knew for sure would work perfectly. And then I tried it and the seams fell apart and I had to improvise and I do something else. And um, it's terrifying in the moment and can be quite discouraging and disappointing. And sometimes we do really have to abandon our initial really fabulous idea because things are happening and, and you know, the thing, the solution rises to the top and that's what you go with. Um, but I think as long as you're like trying to strike a balance of like not phoning it in and um, being a little flexible, I guess, like, um, you know, if things don't go your way um, to not quite give up on it, to, to still have faith that it could be good and maybe even better. Sometimes, sometimes my second and third iteration, I'm like, oh, this is getting really interesting and weird and cool. It's like a plot twist. <laughs> right. Onita says, I'm definitely not phoning it in, but fighting the fear again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, that, that can be interesting, right? So like, if you're talking about starting over, when when are the signals coming from inside the house telling you to, yeah. telling you to start over when really it's just like the fear talking and you don't need to start over. You need to just like calm your nervous system down and, and find a way to just keep going forward. Yeah, it's really, it's not something that's, easy to be prescriptive about to be like when you notice this do xyz right. um the telltale uh <laughs> yeah. I, you know the buzzfeed quiz for like should i start over which would be really <laughs> fun to write with tom maybe we should try to do that but um i don't know exactly i just know i get myself in situations where i try to have the deadline be too soon <laughs> so then i'm like right. ah, like driving at 90 miles an hour towards the deadline like oh it's happening uh just just so I can't change my mind about anything other no. than like, oh, I want to take a nap. I'm like, oh, I can't. I've got to, I've got to keep working. Um, so that's somewhat useful in that I haven't, I haven't done a kind of start over. But I do think at the beginning of a project, I have a certain of I, idea of what I think might happen. And I hold on to those things as I go through the process of like, okay, let's make a first draft. Okay, let's start making the thing. Um but once those things, if they stop serving me, I'm like, either they evolve a little bit or they're just dropped. And, and some, I've, I've noticed rather than starting over, I tend to almost like um, purify or clarify the thing itself as I'm working on it. Not not even intentionally, but there's all this stuff I was holding on to that I thought was essential to the process that like, as I let go of it, I'm like, this is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Like how much? I, now I'm starting to, rather than how many balls can I juggle, I'm like, how many things can I let go of? Will this still go forward if I do a little less and really be specific? And that's almost scarier because <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to unravel completely because I'm still moving at pace towards finishing. it. Yeah. You have to train yourself to, to, to do that, though, to be comfortable with uh, tearing down or hitting a deadline, you know? And and again, those deadlines really are, they're such a gift. There was something you said in an earlier episode and it was related to songwriting and I haven't gotten tired of hearing Tom talk about <laughs> <my> music, <laughs> but uh, you, you had joined this uh, songwriting group where you could share your work and you yeah. shared the song and you were hoping people would be gentle and you got good feedback from the person <laughs> that had something to say. Uh, said something that you're like oh damn it he's actually kind of right it was like uh this is great keep going or keep at it and you're like no bro this is done <laughs> like this is how I work my style I think it was a style episode yeah. or just this is what it is and I'm kind of that, that type of creator too where I'm like how much can I just like put down and leave alone and run away <laughs> as quickly as possible uh, so that there's no maybe it's just because I'm conflict averse with myself and other people but I'm just like uh, the, um, okay like that's fine uh maybe I get easily maybe that's a type of of fear I don't know why did I bring that up Tom help me <laughs> I don't know I'm still trying to parse out the M&M's metaphor but uh, I don't know I'm just yeah. M&M's um you know there's another type of starting over I, I I learned just yesterday or today uh Agnes Varda the great great filmmaker she's so she's so multi I don't want to say multidisciplinary she's just so many she's always going in so many directions both with the kinds of things she films and the kinds of art she makes 
And I just discovered that one thing she makes, although I'm not sure why she started doing it, but I think we just let her do what she wants. One thing she started to do was making little tents and cabins out of literally out of the film of her movies. <laughs> like she makes little tents out of the celluloid and she sits in them. And it's so bizarre and weird and wonderful. And it makes me think that there's so many ways in which you can uh, work with your ideas and work with whatever you're feeling. And so many ways you can you can engage with the things that we engage with in art, you know. I don't know if that's starting over or not. It's doing something different. It's doing something a second time. It's I don't when I first read that, I thought that she did that with abandoned films, like, oh, this film isn't going anywhere. I'm just gonna make a tent out of it, which is a great idea. But I actually think she did it with a uh, ones that were sort of out of circulation of her finished com of her finished uh, movies. I'm trying to answer. I, I I noticed another, and I also didn't know that was Agnes Varda. So uh, Tom had yeah. sent me these images, and I was like, "Wow, this is really cool," and I didn't know that was the artist. Um, the other question was, "How close do your thumbnails have to be to that original pitch? Like, if you pitch a paragraph that's like, oh, this is what I think is going to happen,' and then you start drawing, and you feel as if it's veering too far away from the pitch, it sounds like the topic or content is changing." So my prescriptive advice is to revisit the people you're collaborating with to be like, hey, this is changing. And I think this is where it's ending up. What do you think? Just to check in so it's not so different. But then I need to add it. And I, what if I don't like my pitch anymore? And I was like, well, if you if you locked yourself in to being accountable to other people and to yourself, you, can, you, you are the one that gauges that. It's totally up to you. I would advocate for finishing the thing as quickly as possible <laughs> and, and as close as close as you can to what you think would work unless it's just not working. And then, you know, talk with your your collaborators and say, hey, can we change this completely? See if that's possible. If it's not, try to deliver what you said you're going to deliver, even if it's not, you're not in love anymore and you want to get out of the <laughs> marriage, so to speak. Uh, and then take that, that feeling and invest it in the next comic. We like, the thing that I comfort myself with is this isn't the only comic I'll make, right? Like I'll make another. So, um, I mean, there were moments with the Washington Post. It was such a joy to work with a new um, client and new people. It was also terrifying because I was like, I hope this goes well. Freelancing is famously a hustle <laughs> and scary. And um, the people I worked with were really lovely. The story was really difficult. And and I think, um, you know, I just kept going and I had my, my deadline. Um, but it almost worked so fast that there was this kind of hangover <laughs> after it that I'm still in where I'm like, whoa, like I finished that. I was like, oh, was that the best choice? Like, should I, should I have made that look like that? Or it's not like I'm second guessing everything. And I'm, I still like believe I set it down and it stands as it is. And I'm letting the art be the art. But if there's anything that I feel a little um, conflicted about or uh, maybe ambivalent about, I take that as information for the next project. Um, hopefully <laughs> there's a next one. If not with that client, with somebody else or my own personal work, well, what didn't I love about that? Or what's something that might be useful for next time uh, versus like trying to work out every every issue I have psychologically and personally. <laughs> that's me. That's not the person that asked the question. Uh, in one project, like it's just a constant, um, you know, scavenger hunt or excavation and uh, it's all information it's useful for for next time yeah that's that's really great when you when you can just be comfortable knowing like yeah there'll be another thing and that thing i can explore the things that i missed that i didn't do uh in the way that i that i liked the first time yeah all that's really really valid um there you know i don't know to what degree uh, onita or anybody who's talking about uh when you're in the middle of a project that you've signed on for, right? That you've pitched and that you have somebody waiting in line for. And again, you talked about your collaborators, right? So your editors or your collaborators in some in certain cases, or maybe you are working with a writer or something like that. And that, yeah, that's a negotiation. You have to be, you have to talk to them and say, like, this isn't, this isn't, <laughs> I can't do this. And you know, if there's money involved, sometimes you give the money back. And I've seen it happen. Um definitely seen that happen and other time it's way giving back the money is way better than languishing for 15 years and freaking out um about whether or not the work's any good and not doing it you know as a result or, or i mean it depends on how much money i guess <laughs> if you 
you know, I mean, if it's enough yeah. to outsource it, you might as well just outsource it. I, would, I think, yeah, I think that I, again, like, I don't want to talk too much smack about the client I just worked with. And I, uh, again, great, great people to work with, but it was also, it was just a difficult story. And then at one point I was just like, I just had the figure I was getting paid in my mind. And I was like, that's not a bad amount of money. I mean, I'm doing a lot of work here and I think it averages to like $30 an hour, but like money is money. Like I was just like, let's not be snobbish about this. So like, uh, maybe my standards are like, uh, I wouldn't say low, but like uh, flexible <laughs> depending on like adjuncting is hard. Freelancing is hard. You got to cobble it together. But it, and that's also just a, uh, it's a funny experience. I think, I, I think it's useful I'm collecting these like street streetwise stories so that I can tell whatever students I happen upon don't do what I did. Uh, so sometimes when I feel like I'm not sure if this is the right decision, I'm like, oh, but maybe this is something that will be if it doesn't help me in the future, I can tell <laughs> it'll be a charming <laughs> antidote for the next Anvil episode. And I can tell people how to negotiate or, or, or navigate something like that. It's not always usable. Sometimes stuff is just stuff. But in the way that we're keeping an eye out for our next comic, I'm also like, would this be useful for the bootleggers guide to comics uh and and coincidentally not not to make it uh all about the next episode but we have been talking for a while i think i have to double check i think our next episode is about collaborating oh interesting yes yeah. good i wanted to mention i think um in the comics flow group and a, a lot of our listeners know that this anvil's being recorded in, inside the auspices of the saw comics flow group um I think I'm going to start a little channel that's like the garden of unfinished projects. I'm going to see if people just want to talk mm -hmm. about their unfinished projects. And I thought about graveyard of unfinished projects. I was like, no, no, this is not about death. It's about life. <laughs> and so I think we'll call it the garden of unfinished projects and see if people want to share them a little bit. Because there is, there's, you know, a lot that it, what happens with that, that investment, right? That love and attention we put into a project that we've abandoned, you know, it doesn't have to stay you know, dark and crusty in some box and corner or something. It can be actually talked about. It can actually be looked at. It's like, oh yeah, this was without being like, oh yeah, you should have finished this. Too bad, loser. No, but right? instead it can be like, oh, yeah, this is really, really playful. And it looks like you had a lot of fun working on this and how cool. Um, you know, and again, sometimes I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out like what are the art forms of the future? You know, like maybe we don't all have to do these long projects that have beginning, middles, and ends, and all these other things. What if, what if everybody sort of starts something and then shares it, and then we all go have dinner at Jess's house or something, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I was also thinking about that with the, uh, yeah, come over, come on, everyone come to my house, I'll feed you M&Ms. Pancakes, M&Ms, and... <laughs> it's going to be a weird bowl of fun. Uh, we were talking about, in the year-long program, I had the opportunity to mentor a, a smaller group of cartoonists that are in the last quarter of the program, it's ending in like a month. Uh, and I was like, uh, well, sometimes when we think about comics or maybe just any type of art making, even let's say we're going to make a movie or a song, the, the idea of publishing and sharing with an audience is part of the reason you're making it most of the time, not always. So we tend to think about, and Thomas said this before, capitalism, here's our capitalism <laughs> segment for you, flagging it, uh, and like thinking right. about our art as, as a product, right? Yeah, hopefully, at least we saved it so you're not getting too wasted if this is a drinking <laughs> game, but, uh. It's also <laughs> Tom's like giggling and taking a sip out of an opaque mug. So I'm hoping it's not filled with gin. An opaque mug that says that has the word envy on it. Envy. Ooh. I drink from the cup of envy. That sounds so <laughs> fun. Uh, what the hell was I talking about, Tom? Oh, uh, Chas. Um, what were you talking about? I was after mm -hmm. mentioning food. I'm sorry. I didn't. I... Oh, no. It's okay. <laughs> I was like really. No, no, no. Good. Oh, no. You were talking about art forms and. Uh, Oh yeah, how, just how we view art as a product and a process, not to make it silly, but let, okay, at this point it's episode 14, I am who I am, and <laughs> if you're still listening, thanks for being here, but uh, but yeah, process, there's something that lights people up if, you, if you've been toiling in your brain thoughts over a comic, and then you get on a Zoom call, and you hang out with other people that are also working on a six-page comic, for example, using the year-long program students, and they are all like, oh my gosh, I love your sketches, or that's such a cool idea, or that little idea that hasn't quite become the final has encouraged me to approach my work in an XYZ sort of way. So uh, commuting with other people 
to speak the language of weirdness that you're <laughs> speaking, aka comics. Hopefully, listening to this podcast encourages you. Um, but again, like a shameless plug for socializing on the Saw Mighty Network, it's it's really useful. And I, I like the idea that Tom's speaking to about a garden ra rather than a graveyard, which death sometimes can seem final depending on what level of Buddhism you are. Uh, so mm -hmm. garden has opportunities for growth or unearthing magical bones and other things and, and turnips uh, pieces that could lead to a beautiful meal whatever is in the dirt there's something there so unfinished projects um that can be really great and sometimes uh we have said before it's way more fun to talk about an idea than do the work and finish it some of the time we're like oh why did i tell everyone i was gonna do this why didn't i tell <laughs> I could definitely finish this by that date. Ah, now I've really got it. So yeah, having accountability and a deadline and just going for it without being fully convinced. I think the, the things that are most overrated are um, knowing what you're doing, being convinced of what you're doing. Like the, it's completely overrated and not required for making comics. And sometimes you only need a sprinkling of that, a salt and pepper dash. You don't really need a lot, if any. Maybe you don't even need it. We feel like we do. We do. We want to be encouraged so we can keep going. And even the most confident creators, I do think, still have moments of doubt where like, what the frick am I doing? Or why did I do all that? Or why, what? Let me reinvent myself. So I think there's opportunities for starting over all the time in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. Just by saw Tom is making music and I'm threatening to buy a banjo. <laughs> I like the word, you know, I like bringing in doubt, you know, any, any real any most religions you know at least the people who speak honestly about them talk about doubt being an important part of it you know you have to sort of doubt you can't just subscribe to the dogma the dogma is like this is gonna be a great project and i know what i'm doing yeah. <laughs> the doubt is I, like what am yeah. i doing you know it's so refreshing to be like but like to to go to someone let's say a guru of some kind or like well, what about all these questions i have and they're just like yes and you're like oh that's, that's <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, like doubt is sort of the sexy part of belief. It's just like if you just believed everything, then it was just I believe that this is gonna work. Yeah, I, I mean that's cool too. I guess uh, sometimes I need the belief. I hope you'll write that part down for your book. Doubt is the sexy part of belief. Um, <laughs> related, hey, you know what? I don't know if anyone noticed in the <laughs> recap for the style episode I wrote, your style, like a sexy deranged cicada will emerge eventually. <laughs> no, I didn't a sex notice. crazed cicada is what I called it. <laughs> a sex crazed cicada. All right, that'll be my uh, next week's background image on my Zoom call. Sex crazed uh, cicada. Um, uh, Jennifer mentions that it's, it's about the, you know, um, the connectedness. And I liked what you said about if you, um, if you've been toiling together, right? If this group of people can talk about how they've been toiling together, that's such a magical experience. And sometimes, sometimes that can be the point where everyone is given the energy to keep going. Um, and other times it can be the, the, it can be the point where you're like, yeah, I did, I did what I wanted to do, which was like, move through this process a little bit, toil a little bit, and um, and I'm okay moving on. And I, But again, yeah, that connection with other people can be really, really important. And I'm, again, you know, I, I said I'm looking for the art forms of the future, but I'm also looking for the rituals of the future, you know, and what are those rituals? And those rituals are always involve coming together in some way. And after that, I don't exactly know, but they involve coming together talking you know showing what we've done you've mentioned all these sketches and how the, the even just the sketches are really exciting and how they sort of reflect on the toil that i've been that i've been working what's the verb for toil that's not toil <laughs> i've been toiling myself with or on or with, you know um that experience can be really great putting things up on the wall or putting or just being sharing where we're at in this process that we don't exactly understand we need, I, I, I'm I trying to figure out what, if we can formalize some more rituals like that. And maybe the garden of unfinished projects is one way forward. Yeah. I don't know. It's like a, it's like Bible study for cartoonists. It's being like, I thought this was really weird or I can't quite get past this or this is strange. Or like, yeah, that is weird. Like just getting in a group and digesting something together is um such a good vibe as the kids say. Um, I, I, like there, 
well, and, and to talk about community or connectedness or uh, like making your work, you don't necessarily have to show anything to anybody, but when I have the opportunity to publish my work, I'm definitely doing it. So my friends will read my comic and tell me I'm awesome. Like that's sure. definitely 100% sure. a big reason why I do that. Other than getting paid, I'm like, I I want to I want to feel good about myself. And I feel good when people notice that, hey, they, especially if it's a cartoonist and they kind of know how the sausage gets made, like a compliment <laughs> from another cartoonist, like, hey, I saw your comic. It seems like you put a lot of work into it. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I genuinely mean it. So the comic came out yesterday. It's digital, you know, it's not like a book release or anything like that. There's some tangibility to, and uh, like most websites, sometimes there's a paywall and sometimes there's not. So I shared it in the morning and then I went to work and I didn't really hear back from a lot of people. And uh, I got really discouraged. <laughs> and later in the day, I started to get like notes from people that say, oh, I read your comic. Oh, that's really cool. The other thing is like the that particular comic was like sort of heavy. So I was like conflicted about sharing nice. it with people because I want to bump people out. Because And it also sounds really weird. Like, I'm really excited I finished this thing. And then you look at it, you're like, ah, it's like a big bummer. So there's excitement and sadness. There's like a lot of feelings. Um, but definitely, I, I think like being able to share stuff, I almost prefer sharing process to final work because it doesn't feel like I'm holding my breath. Like, oh God, I, I hope my friends like this. Uh, it would be okay if nobody did, like I would survive. But uh, but I like this idea of everyone gathering around the light and the warmth of work in progress. And, and it's a contagious sort of enthusiasm where you're like, oh, like the possibility of this is so magical that I've got a hundred ideas myself. It's not always like that, but uh, but often it is often it is yeah. I don't know like anytime oh, like for example I was I was teaching this class in in person at a university about reading graphic novels and kind of analyzing why artists might have made the decisions they made so we're looking at final art and then towards the end of the semester that's when I feel comfortable enough I'll show them some of my sketches and I'm like is this interesting to anybody just checking in and everyone was like yeah yeah, yeah. I don't know if I mean that's a loaded question I feel like you have to say yes <laughs> Uh, but, but I, I guess I, I do think there's something universal about getting to see how behind the scenes stuff, like how something sure. happened or re watching a documentary and you're like, oh, I had no idea there was all this drama behind this, this situation <laughs> or something like that. I don't know. Um, there's a kind of lore to the way things get made and being part of that or next to it, I don't know, just feels, feels very positively conspiratorial. Uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. And and again, you know, it's early 21st century. We've all got so much more access to art making, right? I made songs because it was really easy, right? Like to do these things that 40 years ago, you would have needed to book time in a big room uh, and a lot more equipment for and stuff like that. My point being is that as more people are plugged into art making, um, we can talk about that process more and more people are conversant in being able to talk about the process. And it's, it's a fun new way to talk about um, or to engage with art as practitioners. We're all engaging in with art as pract as practitioners. And that can be, we're not really talking about starting over, are we? But, but we're talking well, like we've... <laughs> to engage in things. No, that's okay. Well, I wanted to ask you one more question before I go. Is is starting over harder than starting or is starting over starting? Like, are we the ones that prescribe that it's starting over? So starting over feels like starting, but with even more baggage, You're like, oh my God, this was so hard. And now it somehow <laughs> seems even harder because I know how to start. And yet it's still, I thought that starting would be easier if I had done it once, but it turns out it's still tricky to do. What's the question? So the question is, <laughs> Starting versus starting over. Is one harder than the other? What's the difference? Or is starting over just an illusion and it's just starting? Oh, no. Um, starting starting is harder than starting over. I mean, anybody, you know, the first time you make something, you're probably really shy about it or you're unsure. If you can give yourself at least the practice of having gone through that process a little bit, then you under, then you can understand, hopefully you can have some wisdom and say like, okay, I know what a misstep feels like, <laughs> you know? So, so I know that misstep, I know not to make that misstep. Um, 
so yeah, anytime you go through a process, even if it's even if it's it's truncated, it's you you have the opportunity to gain some wisdom for it. So I think I think starting anew is harder. That's why everyone says don't start with a blank page and don't like, you know, don't finish your session with the end and then have a blank page tomorrow. I'll finish mid-sentence, like I don't who it was very oh, right. yeah. Um there or the reason every single writer advocates making a crappy first draft because then you have something to to edit right and that editing is that starting over i don't know but it's but it's um but it's it's not starting over actually not from scratch i mean and it's not thinking i have to do everything right the first the first time it's yeah giving yourself the, the gift of starting again on something you're already aware of you can also even if even if you have like a lot of confidence or a lot of um, like a good track record, like oh, I'm working on my third novel and my first and second were New York Times bestsellers and <laughs> New York whatever and prize prize prize. Like I think there's a lot of pressure to like keep keep doing it, keep keep clocking that level of success or or at least finishing sure. stuff. Um, even um, I hope this is okay to say, but sometimes my husband gets nervous before he goes to work. I get nervous before I do literally anything, going to the grocery store, recording a podcast, I'm like just covered in sweat and then I'm fine. But it, this is like anticipatory anxiety. I think that's something that's natural and human to a lot of people. But, um, you know, he's been doing the same job for over a decade and he's still like, all right, I'm going to go do it again. And so like showing up to work or showing up for family or, or do, doing a thing, not to get too philosophical, it is a type of starting over. And so sometimes if it's something we've always done, sometimes we get in a groove or a flow yeah. where we're like, we have the confidence to keep doing what we're doing. But sometimes we're like, oh my gosh, I, I kind of need to reassess what I'm doing or I'm starting to feel different about it. So even if we keep our recipe the same, we're, we're constantly changing a little bit for whatever reason. So it's good to start over. It's okay to start over. And um, it's possible to start over. And it's also possible to be in a groove that's working. You started this episode talking about getting in a groove. So Are we grooving? Thing. We're in a groove. 14 episodes in. And next week is about collaboration, which neither I think of us so. know anything about. Yeah. What, what did you say, Tom? <laughs> which neither of us know anything about, but of course. Yeah. It's well, we're collaborating on this podcast and it's right. going right. great so far. <laughs> so... Yes, episode 15, how to collaborate. Uh, that's all I have in <laughs> any notes. I was thinking like, okay, maybe freelancey, like I could talk about uh, collaborating with writers or editors. I, I have a little bit of knowledge of that. But there's other types of collaboration, like maybe uh, when when you're sharing your process, that's a kind of collaboration to invite people in while work is in progress to, to see yeah. what they think. Kind of collaborating and outsourcing some of those ideas. We're willfully ignoring them as Molly Rose does, which I salute. <laughs> I love hearing everyone's opinion and then be like, cool, I'm going to go do what I want. Um, that's also a dance move. Uh, I don't know of other types of collaboration. I mean, this is a collaboration. It doesn't always have to be uh, specifically like, I don't know, I wish we could get someone from Marvel that's like, I'm a penciler or a letterer or an inker, and they have a specific uh, assembly line designation. So there's there's more abstract versions of collaboration, but I can give you hopefully some like brass tax advice on collaborating for yeah. the collaborating for the conflict avoidant cartoonists. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. That'll be, the, that'll be. Every time. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thanks everybody who thanks joined you. us in the chat live and wherever else you found us live. Thanks to everybody who has found us deep in the space time continuum elsewhere. Um, Jess, thanks. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you actually. Spoiler alert, you and I are going to talk after this too, right? Yes, yes, just, oh, yeah. just to hang nice. with, yeah, just without hang. reservations. But yeah, so we'll start over next week for episode 15. <laughs> Does that sound good? All right, everybody. See you later. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks, thanks Meg. Thanks, Thank so you, much. Meg. Bye. Thanks for joining us. This has been a production of the Sequential Artists Workshop, or SAW. You can find us on social media at Comics Workshop and online at sawcomics.org. You can hear about our many courses at learn.sawcomics.org. SAW is a nonprofit and supported by people like you. Learn how to make a tax deductible donation at the donate page of sawcomics.org. You can join our free community of comics explorers at members.sawcomics.org. Thanks so much for being here.